well. And we've seen in our, in, our, in our brief concept, for those who have looked at it, that cancer, cervical cancer, kills more than 300,000 people every year. That is uh, globally. But here in Kenya, it is estimated that at least over 3,000 women uh, die from this uh, disease every year. And uh, about close to over 5,000 of them are diagnosed with the disease every year. So these are statistics according to the Kenya cervical cancer. And uh, it's something that we need to discuss very candidly. You are here, you have the professionals, professionals are here who deal with this matter on a daily basis. And they'll be able to share with you their expertise and you can engage them as much as you, you'd wish to. Uh, it is important that Kenyans know that this disease is not, is not a joke. And I'm sure many of you know that. It's only that we have not given it the prominence that it deserves. And we need to find the solutions and see how best we can deal with this matter. At least the experts will tell us from what I've a bit, read a bit, that at least cervical cancer if detected in the pre-stage and the vaccine uh, HPV is used, then it can be, it can be, something can be done. They'll be, they'll be telling us, I'm not an expert in that field, so they'll be able to tell us all this and we can engage them. So it is important that as members of the guild, we'll be able to, to engage them and be able to ensure that this matter is brought to the surface and we are able to take it with the seriousness it deserves. So before we proceed, even as we are eating, I think it's important that we should be able to know who is in the room. We can do some introductions, quick ones, even as we continue to, to, to have our lunch. So I think I'll start with this side, this table, I'll, 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 I'll skip it for now. Uh, I don't know that we have another, we have another, another mic around here, probably you can pass it around so that guys can introduce themselves so that the key speakers here will be able to let our guests here can be able to know who is in the room. Good afternoon everyone, my name is Leon Lidigo, I'm a global health and climate journalist at National Media Group. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, my name is Rachel Nakitare. Elementary Broadcasting Unit. My name is Swan. Okay, remember. With my man, mouthful, my name is Patista Labs Robert. I'm Kate Council member. My name is Mashari Wamugo of TV47, CAG member. Good afternoon. I'm Judy Caberia, a member of CAG, and I work for Frederick Norman Foundation for Freedom. Hi everyone, my name is Rachel Lombaka. I um, currently work at the Africa Report and I'm also a chairperson of the AJA Award, um, the panel of judges, the ones who are judging the stories. And I'd like to invite you all on the second and the third. Um, we'll be recognizing outstanding journalists in the industry. Thank you. Thank you, my chair. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Ian Kukachikoros. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Kasim Wandilo from Tani Radio, a reporter. Good afternoon. Uh, I have chosen with my name. I write for I write, I write for Standard and Science Issues. I also have my media consulting firm called based on me and the Science Institute. Uh, good afternoon. 
afternoon. I'm Waboi Wamunyo, I'm a university lecturer and a researcher, a CAG member. Salim Wade, Majina Naito Diango Lale, member of CAG, and a media consultant and a biographer. I'm Jango, I'm a Levi Oponya, I'm a Mualimu, I'm a media. Habili huyo ni Professor Levi Oponya. Good morning, afternoon. Good afternoon. I was just checking whether to file. <laughs> My name is Lena Busibori. I write for Talk Africa and also Africa Science News. Good afternoon. My name is Ivan Kibe, Tani Radio. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Bernard Mwinzi, Managing Editor of the Nation and a member of the game. Good afternoon. My name is Ken Bosuria, Programs Cake. I'm Bariya Mchana. 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 Good afternoon. My name is Anne, Kenya Editor's Girl, Member Service Coordinator. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, as you can see, we have a whole combination of uh, both uh, uh, secular, vernacular, you can't call them vernacular, what do you call them? Vyombo vya habari mtaani, where this matter is also affecting our people, together with the mainstream media as well. So at this juncture, because I've left this table purposely, I want to invite our Chief Executive Officer at the Kenya Editors Guild, Madam Rosalia, to come over and be able to introduce the guest that she has on her table, and then she can proceed from there. Thank you, Martin. Uh, good afternoon. Happy that you were able to make it to our press club luncheon. We would like to uh, promote uh, credible voices. We would like to uh, amplify the credible voices so that we are able to report better. So uh, then, I'd like to introduce the guests from this table. Uh, from the, from that end, we have um, Linda Bunch, council member. Kenya Editors Guild. Kenya Editors Guild is a professional association for media, for senior editors in Kenya. And our mission really, our role is to promote professionalism and excellence in journalism. So our members are basically gatekeepers, the senior editors in the newsrooms, as well as those who have transitioned to academia and are specifically teaching journalism in the journalism schools. And uh, we do that because uh, one of our key targets is to impact the next generation of editors. So we want to also influence how they are taught in the journalism schools. Right? Next, we have um, Mildred Gessa. Okay, she is um, a trans. A, she's a, a, a motivational speaker. Inspirational, there's a difference. All right. She's an inspirational speaker, and she'll be telling us her story uh, later on in, 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 in this program. Right? Then I'll come this side. Uh, Professor Nelly Mugo. Right? She is our keynote speaker today. She'll be coming to talk to us later. And, um, uh, she's a researcher, clinical researcher and also working at the Kenya Medical Research Institute. Then we have our Director General, Medi Ministry of Health, uh, Dr. Patrick Amon. We are glad that you could join us. Uh, I'll be introducing the, the President of the Guild a little later on, but just a short brief about why we are doing this today. Um, credible Voices, it is um, the aim of Credible Voices is basically to amplify voices 
um, that promote uh, development, health issues, women empowerment, financial services for the poor, climate adaptation, research and development among others. So those would be the credible voices that we would be looking at. But today specifically we are looking at cervical cancer. Um, right, and uh, we would like to amplify these voices uh, through convening our regular sessions. The aim is to uh, use these voices to ensure we are getting it right in the specific issues that we are talking about. We report inaccurately because we have not uh, we have not spoken to the right people or we have spoken to the people but we have not captured correctly what we should be reporting. So as part of the mandate of the guild, it's, it's our business to provide platforms that would then engage people in various um, in various sectors to come and talk to us about their sectors. And that's really what we are doing today. The project also engages, um, besides the thought leadership series, the project aims at um, exposing reporters and editors to, uh, to, to, to research facilities that are breaking work in, in, with, with health and development outcomes, right? So we would like then to do this so in, 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 in the interest of promoting informed dialogue and evidence based at the of issues of importance, such we would like to report accurately and contribute as journalists to better health outcomes. We would like to avoid disinformation and misinformation and demystify myths around cervical cancer and all other cancers. I say that we exist to promote professionalism and excellence in journalism, therefore that is what we would like to lead by. So I want to say thank you very much um, for coming to this, to this uh, press club and uh, looking forward to learning a lot more about cancer and about the vaccine status. Right now, I'd like to take the opportunity then to welcome on board the president of Kenya Editors Guild, Zubeda Hanan. Dr. Patrick Amon, the Acting Director for Health in the Ministry of Health. Professor Nelly Mugo, Principal Clinical Research Scientist at Center for Clinical Research. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm happy to see you all. Karibuni sana to our press club. Our thought leadership series today focuses on cervical cancer and HPV vaccine. A topic that I hold so dear, first as a woman, a mom, and as a journalist, that has interacted firsthand with women that have been affected by cervical cancer. Colleagues, as journalists, we often find ourselves in the role of preachers of the gospel, engaging in conversations and disseminating information that encourages individual, individuals to prioritize their well-being. Through our stories and advocacy, we have the power to inspire action, promote preventive measures, and ultimately save lives. But how often do we prioritize our health? Let's do a random survey. How many of us have ever done a pap smear? I'm talking to women here. Or HPV test. I can count the hands, like we are very few, less than 10, yeah? That tells you something. How many of us do this test annually, or at least once every two years? Yeah? Now we have three women in the room. <laughs> How many of us <laughs> have taken the HPV job? I think I'm the only one in the room. How many of us have taken our daughters for the HPV vaccine? How many? Five. 
five of us. What does that tell us? And we talk about it every day. We host people, we host experts every day. But back home, we are not doing it. This survey was not just for women. Men in the house, how many of us encourage our spouses to prioritize this? How many of you have ever told your wife or your sister or your daughter or your mom to go for a pap smear? Only one man in the room, two. How many of you have taken your daughters for the job? Men. Men. Only one man in the room. Yeah? What's happening? Why are we not doing it? Do we prioritize our work over our, our health? Or do, is it that we don't have time to do it? Yeah, that's food for thought. I'm reminded of a personal journey that deeply resonates with the theme for today's discussion. Last year, during the Cervical Cancer Awareness Month, a dear colleague and friend joined me in taking a proactive step, step towards the cervical health. We underwent HPV tests, followed by pap smears, and diligently completed the three doses of HPV vaccine. I also made sure to extend this protective and protection to my daughter, ensuring she received the vaccine as well. I must confess, like many other women or moms, I initially harbored a hesitation. However, experiencing the process firsthand, witnessing the positive impact and feeling a sense of responsibility as a preacher of the gospel transformed my perspective. I can now stand before you today, not just a journalist, but also as someone who has embraced this pre preventive measure with pride, confidence, and an informed perspective. Recently, a colleague reached out seeking advice on whether to vaccinate her nine-year-old daughter. Without hesitation, I encouraged her to proceed, drawing from my own experience and the reassurance that there is indeed nothing to fear, but more to gain from these vaccines. I urge each one of us, my esteemed colleagues, to prioritize our health by undergoing necessary medical tests and considering vaccination, especially for our daughters. It is heartening to note that these vaccines are readily available in the government hospitals, free of charge, making them accessible to all. While my family opted for a private hospital, hospital for convenience, I emphasize that cost should never be a barrier to safeguarding our well-being. Together, let us come together and continue to preach, not just through words, but also through actions that promote health, empower communities, and contribute to a healthier, more informed society. Lest we forget, um, I would like to ask, ask our experts today, is there a job similar to the HPV vaccine for men? Because we hear they are the carriers of the virus. It's the same vaccine. It's the same vaccine. Maybe you will tell us more when you come here. Do they have tests similar to the tests that we go as women? Like pap smear, they go for tests here and there. You talk about it. That's And I thank you all for your attention and look forward to an insightful and impactful discussion today. That's a Thank you so much, Madam President. Another round of applause for Madam. Uh, as you can rightly see, we have a lot of uh, discussions on this matter to make. I'm also getting to learn. I'm a journalist of many years, but there are some things that I, I didn't know, and I'm getting to know them now, and it's good for me. I didn't know that I, should, I can be able to take my young girl for, for a, a vaccine. I think now you have converted me when I live here. It's one of those things I'm <laughs> on, on my to-do list. Thank you very much. Well, uh, uh, as you can see from the program, we have something that is called an inside take. We, have, we normally have a journalist who, has, who is on, on hands-on in matters of 
the stories that come through them and they're able to, under, to read those copies and be able to, to get uh, to know their subject very well. So they'll be able to tell us what they have been able to deduce from the stories that their, their uh, journalists on the ground have been able to, to be, I mean, they've been writing. So at this time, I'm going to call my friend Bernard Mwinzi, the managing editor of the nation, to come here and give us the inside take on this subject. Rick Bernard. A round of, of applause for Bernard. Thank you. Thank you for that very elaborate uh, introduction. Um, I will touch briefly on uh, the things that I have discovered first as, um, as a reporter and second as an editor. Um, when uh, I was asked to speak about this matter, I, I, I felt like I needed to be here because it's something that has been very, very close to me for a very, very long time. Health and science generally are very, very close to me and, and I normally grab every opportunity I have to discuss the intersection between journalism and, and science and sometimes um, academia, academia itself. Um, I wanted to start by talking about what we journalists think cancer is and how we report it. But I think that has already been touched on a little bit, so I will not delve into those issues. I will discuss the issues that I uh, experience and that we as uh, journalists have experienced in the news. Um, but the first thing I need to ask is whether we understand what this means for us, what this forum is all about for us uh, as media practitioners. I think it's important because that gives us some form of grounding so that this conversation now moves away from this room to our newsrooms and uh, to our audiences out there. And I want you to consider this. If you walk to Nairobi Hospital and ask for an HPV vaccine to it will cost you around 25,000 shillings. Um, what is the median salary of, of the average Kenyan? How much does the average Kenyan spend on food, clothing, and rent? Uh, in a month. If you go to KNH, it's about 6,000 shillings. Between 6,000, I think, uh, 10,000, I'm not sure, but somewhere there. And it is not always a microphone. We talk about cervical cancer as if it's one of those many other cancers. But the fact of the matter is that this is one of the few preventable cancers that we have. We can actually stop it in its trunk if we are careful, deliberate, and focused about it. Which is why I was really, really surprised uh, to learn that Gavi is launching a program in Tanzania to provide this vaccine free of charge in all public hospitals. I was told just yesterday, as I was researching for this, that Gavi had sought a partnership with the Kenyan government for the same.
concerned. For a lot of us, we do not have that patience. And therefore, there is a fractured relationship between the scientists, the experts, who knows these things, and we, the journalists, who um, work tight deadlines, need to deliver that story immediately, and do not have the patience to research, to wait, and therefore publish something that is uh, credible. What we have discovered, though, is that where that relationship exists and where that relationship is nurtured, then the journalism is better. And I say that because we journalists and the scientists, the doctors, the professionals, exist for the same reasons as far as uh, the audiences, our members of the public are concerned. Our fidelity, our fidelity as journalists is always to our audiences. And when we serve them right, give them the right information, address the informational needs, then uh, we serve them right. And we are doing what our, our, our profession calls of us. Um, the president has said that people do not want to go for tests. And I'm wondering why. Is it that they cannot afford it? Or is it that we have not told them uh, to go for it? And when I talk about we, is we as a collective, we as journalists and the government as well. Is the government running a robust communication campaign for this? If so, where is it happening? What formats? How is it propagated? Is it um, sending the right information to the right people in the right shapes and formats? And most importantly, uh, even in the right postures, because that will determine the uptake of that um, information. I remember we had a, you know, a heated conversation about, uh, for instance, um, earlier designs of campaigns against HIV and what it took to steady the ship and you know, say this is the direction we are going to take. Is it time we as communicators uh, realize that something is not working as far as um, the HPV vaccine is concerned or as far as uh, prevention of uh, cervical cancer is concerned and redesigned our approaches to communication as far as this is concerned. I think it is important because that then will give us a solid grounding um, as communicators to start moving forward. Um, people still have to pay for pap smear tests. They do. Um, I asked around and I was told it's about five, between 5,000 and 10,000 shillings. And this is not covered by insurance. I don't know whether you paid out of pocket or you get to, um, um, uh, or it was covered by your medical insurer. And then again, I don't know whether that's, whether science science can help us deal with this subject. Women complain that the tests are very invasive, um, and therefore, when we talk, and we've done quite a number of stories about this. Actually, I remember that one of the stories that we did about cervical cancer was to send a young reporter to go tested for this and then write her experience. And at first she didn't want to do it. Uh, I could guide you to that story. But it was one of those personal experience stories that tell the pain, the shock, the dilemma, the shame itself of going for this. And then we ask ourselves, if this enlightened young journalist, who has gone to school, who is a health and science reporter, does not want to go for this, or if when she goes, she feels this way, what would the average young girl feel? Who is targeted in these uh, projects and programs? Who is the face, or should be the face, of the cervical cancer uh, prevention uh, project. That story obviously enlightened us as, 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 as journalists and editors regarding what people go through every day and why there appears to be a disconnect between what are the desired outcomes, what people should be getting, and what eventually uh, comes out. That perhaps could also explain the law uptake of the vaccine, or also the law uptake, the, the law uh, prevalence, not prevalence, the, the law acquisition of uh, pubs and tests. 
I asked two of my colleagues, as I was preparing for this, to tell me what they think about uh, our coverage of cervical cancer and of health issues generally. And I asked them because specifically, they have been awarded recently for their coverage of this matter. One of them is uh, Angela Kech, uh, who just, I, th I think a week or so ago, uh, received an award for quality, for, for journalism from the Quality Wellness uh, Trust, I think. And the other one is Helen Shikanda, who has just come back from the US, where she received uh, a global award for, after emerging the best print journalist in the world from the American Association for Cancer Research. And I asked Thank you very much, thank you very much. And I asked them, what do you think we are getting right as far as reporting this is concerned? When we go for these trainings and we say, yeah, uh, the DG said this, the, this new report, this new data suggests this, and then we say that's the big story of the day. But for the patient and for the young girls, the young women who are suffering or who are at the risk of suffering from this, information should flow regularly and um, in the shape and format that is of interest to them. We rarely report prevention. I have noticed that there is a new trend in the medical fraternity towards prevention as opposed to treatment. So health now is more, and I think health policies are more preventive than curative. But we still um, in that space and we became deliberately involved in the preventive conversation as opposed to uh, in the curative one. The why question about cancer is rarely answered. Why are so many women dying of cervical cancer? Why? Are our policies enough? Is our research right? Is the technology right? The why question is never, ever answered in useful. And when we attempt to do it, we scandalize it. So we talk about theft.
able to sell that idea to the people that it's important to get this vaccine. And this is the dividend that is going to accrue out of you taking that vaccine. HPV falls in that. vaccine program, which was both facility-based, that the girls 10 to 14 would walk into a facility and get the vaccine, but also throughout Kiches and in Kiches in the community until COVID happened and disrupted the entire landscape. And all those gains that you had made were raised within that time of COVID-19. Our HPV vaccine is administered in two doses, the first dose, what we call a zero dose, and the second dose at, after six months. Currently, data from the Kenya Health Information System, dose one, we are at 28%, and dose two, we are at 24%. Because if you look at that interval of six months, some people forget, some are lost, pull up, they move from one facility to the other. cervical cancer is such a big problem and therefore we needed to come up with uh, targets or indicators to track towards elimination of this scourge by the year 2030. So target number one is that we vaccinate 90 disrupted by COVID, and we are able to achieve 28%. So it means we can be able to reach 90% if we work collectively together. And working with people like you will be able to convey the correct information. And remember also when you are introducing a new vaccine, the issues of vaccine hesitancy, the misinformation, the disinformation, and most of the guidelines indicated that only girls take the vaccine. You remember the battles we had to do with the religious communities. So getting those people on our side to be able to start making uh, moves in terms of numbers was not easy. And this the government cannot be able to do alone. They require all actors, the same religious leaders, opinion leaders, our teachers, the journalists, everybody, political leaders, so that we can be able to champion this cause to them. Goal number two is to be able to ensure that 70% of our women aged 25 to 49 years are screened annually. Our annual target for that, if you convert into absolute number, is about 1.1 million women. And as at last year, we were at 38%. So between now and 2030, if we can be able to push the 32%, we can be able to meet and probably we will exceed the global target. So progress has been made. It is slow. It was disrupted by COVID-19. But all is not lost. We can be able to cover the lost ground. And the third target is that 90% of women who are screened and found to have either precancerous or cancerous lesions are treated. And again, that one government has worked together with partners to ensure that we build the capacity of the health workforce, one, to be able to know what is precancerous, what is normal, what is precancerous, what is cancerous. We have been able to supply machines, including the two ways of doing this, especially and Bob will talk about it, thermal ablation, whether you treat it with heat or cold. And we have been able to procure more than 1,000 thermal ablation machines. Then there's a high magnification 
microscope called a colposcope. Again, you have procured those and claim they have purpose to be able to utilize them. So in view of the figures that we have and the time period required to achieve those targets, I believe if you make concerted efforts, then it is that have embraced HPV vaccination. There was a study that came out of uh, I think one of the European countries. We can be able to wipe it out of the face of planet Earth. That is why we are also embracing other innovations like self collection kits that allows you to be able to do this in the privacy of your home and then you can be able to dispatch it. Number two, one or another challenge, of course, is the human capital. We have had a paucity of oncologists trained specialists in that area. And uh, some industry now have training is not just general, it is really more focused because water resources are scarce and therefore we need to be able to deploy them in the right place, in the right manner so that we can be able to get great maximum dividend. That is why now when doctors, and again beginning this year, we'll actually have what we call a residency program kind of approach. You apply to the Ministry of Health after we have discussed with the training institutions that this is an available position for us as a ministry because we have a look we have a view of the entire ecosystem. In given numbers, it will not be your that I, as a government, I want to be an internist, and therefore I must go for that course now. You have to comply to what we require as a country. The other challenge of uh, dealing with chronic conditions include financing. And again, I reflect back on the laws that were signed on the 19th of October last year, the Social Health Insurance Act of 2023, created what we call the emergency critical illness and chronic, critical illness and chronic illness fund. Again, which is supposed to be fully funded by the exchequer to the tune of about 20 billion Kenya shillings as seed capital. Many a times, the range of tests that we are supposed to go through, the number of consultations we are going to undertake with the specialists. Many a times, your cover runs out even before. And many a times, Kenyan start treatment, either chemotherapy or radiotherapy.
priority the government is giving to this public health budget and we'll continue to work together with all partners to be able to support our cause. At a global level we are working with the International Atomic Energy Agency which has gladly offered to give us two line up, linear accelerator, about the one that generates the beams that are used to burst the cancer cells. And we are going to place one of those equipment in Nakuru and the other one in Kenya. Any cancer center that we start is supposed to have two machines at any given time, so that if there's a downtime, the services are not disrupted because the next machine quickly kicks in. such that when we also have our events outside, we go there as a team. That this team of journalists are the ones who are working with the Ministry of Health, so that we are able to roll these things up.
outside Nahumicha's office for one and a half hours just to, with questions that Kenyans needed answers to. How are we going to work with the Ministry of Health that is not talking to journalists, that treats journalists like enemies? I think someone told them their job is to safeguard their bosses from answering questions. Thank you. Another quick one? Yes. Take, uh, bear in mind that the DG needs to dive out to a very important meeting. Uh, my name is Wapori Wamunyo, and because I'm a researcher, I have a, an interest in research. I want to make two proposals to the DG. Um, one is about the provision of statistics as ways to communicate about the work that you're doing. Um, and if it is available data already, uh, are there portals or places that this information can be found? Not just about cervical cancer, but more broadly about other health issues. Um, the second is actually a, a proposal um, concerning our health uh, coverage. Um, a lot of cancers are discovered at stage three and four, uh, to my understanding. And if uh, preventive care can enable that cancers to be found at stage one or two, where I think they have better chance of being treated, um, is it possible that even uh, SHIF or NHIF, um, these health insurances, the public ones, that if somebody is not using health insurance uh, for, you know, you, you had an accident, you were admitted, but in the whole year you spent money, that you can be given a provision to even get tested for certain things or to get full medical checkup so that it is at getting preventive care and capturing these things. So that is my proposal. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, last one. Oh. Sorry, I've just grabbed the microphone for the technical of you. I want to have a burning <laughs> question. My name is Odia Bonale, I'm the consultant. My question is this, but before the question, a comment. Bonadigi, you worked with so much zeal, especially the time when COVID was here, and you saved our lives. And if anything, you need an award. If I was the President of the Republic of Kenya, you'd have gotten an award. Now the question is this. <laughs> Cancer came after COVID among and AIDS, but it came and overtook all of them. And it, it became no longer just a health issue, it became a national issue, security issue and everything. And it, within two years, by the time it was disappearing, wherever it went, everybody knew what COVID is, what causes it and not. Why is it that with cancer, there's still especially the issue of the way we talked about men, why men, we seem like we don't know and we just choose not to know. And we are also fear even to take our spouse or even our daughters there. Why is there that this thing has not uh, come, uh, is still uh, being alien to us, especially as men now? Thank you. Yeah, I think the DG can take those ones because he needs to dive out. Because you because he won't be there when I'm speaking. Okay, I'll take another second. Now. Okay. Yeah. So that I don't lose my thought process. Uh, I will not answer Leon's first part of the question because my boss has dealt with that matter on Tuesday during the press brief at uh, KICC. And as a bureaucrat, you know, once your boss has spoken, a position has been taken. I stand in that position. Uh, regarding your second part of the question, and I have conversation. Yes, during COVID, it worked very, very well. Because um, we had Martin, we had other people from the media, and information flow was seamless. seamless. But apparently after COVID, then we got again disjointed. I am usually available to be able to provide information, but that notwithstanding, I cannot be able to provide information for everything in the ministry. So what we need to do, if you can be able to have a discussion, we can be able to have a structured way of engagement, whether we can be able to allocate even just two hours in a week where we can be able to engage with you and uh, share information, respond to your questions. 
that can be a proposal that can be able to come from this uh, credible voices meeting. Uh, well, yes, you are, your suggestion of us using statistics, yes, and there's even a photo of the ministry. If you go to our website, you know you have a school at the ministry called MOH Virtual Academy, where you can even be able to undertake a training, you will get a certificate that is credible. Yes, so we need to work together so that uh, the challenge I have is that we do a lot, but it's only known to ourselves. So we need to be able to have a system of how we can be able to convey this information to the public. Yes, Udiambo, about stigma, fear, misinformation, all of society approach, everybody, us are all to be able to play in this. Men, we must be able to support our women to be able to go for screening. We must feel comfortable enough that I can be able to take my teenage daughter to the clinic for HPV vaccination. And if we do it together as one whole society, how we are going to make a difference. And also by conveying the correct information. Yes, now let me just stand here and uh, respond. Uh, yeah. Have you finished with what the Yes, yes, I've finished that one, that oh. section. Yes. Thank you, Bona Digi. My fear is that you will leave before I speak. So may I just ask, as a cancer survivor and warrior, so we say warrior when you're still in active treatment, and I am, I want to implore you on two issues. Point number one, because of the strike, as we strike, as you speak, Cancer warriors are falling by the hundreds, and we know that. Because as you know very well, Dr. Tari, when you start active treatment, you can't stop. You are not supposed to start key to stop chemo in the middle. You are not supposed to stop radio in the middle. You have to restart. I want to urge you, and I know you have done it because of the person that you are, to visit cancer centers to see the turmoil, the heartbreak, the desperation. The private hospitals are trying to manage. The public hospitals are at zero. It is a plea and it is a cry. Point number two, Buenadigi, as all. Well, the plea that I had in my heart was how can this government not make cancer a national pandemic, a national disaster. Bonadigi, I did my mastectomy in a very small hospital that had 12 beds. I asked them at the end of my session, there are four days, how many mastectomies do you do in a week? They told me, Mildred, in a week we do about 12, and hysterectomies we can handle about seven. In a small hospital of 12 beds. My media colleagues, journalists, do the maths if we are talking Kenyatta or the hospitals in the in the community areas. So my question to you, Bonadigi, like Olale, my senior has said, we have seen the zeal in how you work. Cancer is a pandemic and you know it. People are falling by the by the by the drops. We don't even even know the exact numbers. Could this be that the time of your tenure that we will make cancer? a national disaster so that the emergency, the criticalness, the urgency of the cancer beast can be addressed as it should. Thank you, Bonadigi. Awesome. Any other, a quick one? Yeah. A very quick one. My name is Marie Yambo from KBC. So um, I heard you speak and you talked about the self-testing kits because again, I think one of the speakers talked about, you know, uh, with hypoxia being a barrier for a lot of women. So how available, how much available, I mean, how available is it? Does the public know about it? Because I happen to know about it um, from another, you know, engaging with uh, other, other people. And is it for free? The other thing, you know, we are targeting a cervical cancer, which is affecting women. But what are we doing? to sensitize men, because um, I'm, not, I'm not so sure about the science of it, but it is sexually transmitted. So how much is being done to also sensitize the men, even as we target the, the women? In, uh, in as far as preventive is concerned, I also understand nutrition is a very big part of it. How much is being done? In as far as nutrition is concerned, even if 
you're providing the, the, I mean, the means of uh, test, early testing and all that. Thank you. A last one. Let, let me go that side. It's it. Thank you, Martin. Uh, my name is Maslid Nabala, also a cancer survivor. My response is almost similar to my sister Mildred. When I look at the figure, 10 women dying per day, and I'm, I just, I'm just trying to picture it, 10 women per day, it is like all the women in this room. Within a week, they're not there. Within a week, that, that is what is translates statistics when you put a, a, a person to it. So my question is, I, I also have a similar question. Is it possible to now declare breast, uh, cervical, and prostate national disasters? These three cancers, I think, from my experience interacting, these are the major ones. And then uh, my next question is, um, similar, related to that question, what is the public communication that you're currently employing? I'm imagining the rural areas, how are you reaching the schools, the, the age of the girls that are supposed to do the, the, the HPV test vaccine. Is there a, a very, very clear way to reach them that <clears throat> maybe all the primary school can be reached so that they are caught early? Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm uh, going to read the last one from our legal team uh, uh, together with uh, the <laughs> here. Thank you, Yet yeah, clearly, apart from being an editor, my other life I'm also a lawyer, and I've got clients who want who are suing uh, the doctors, wanting negligence, especially in diagnosis, what called misdiagnosis. Uh, when they go to India, they are told, had you come earlier, or had the, in Kenya been done the correct diagnosis, we would have saved you. And now, when they come back, they want to sue the new group. Uh, could you please address this in Mr. That's the misdiagnosis. Is that a problem in Kenya? Thank you. How quickly, Mr. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, somebody has asked a question about the shortage of uh, cancer treatment. I think uh, chemo, chemo treatment. I don't know whether that was answered. If you could please address that issue because uh, I think sometime last year there were cancer um, patients who ha who are complaining about the shortage of uh, that treatment. But I also want to throw in the issue of uh, the cancer of men, prostate cancer. Uh, do we know the numbers? Thank you. I think you can take those on the beach. Okay, thank you. Uh, from my sister here, the warrior, of course, and I've spoken to this earlier, that uh, industry of the ceremony disappropriate, uh, disproportionately affects women, children, the elderly, those with disability, and marginalized communities. During this strike, of course, the disruption of the services has negatively affected service delivery. And with our brothers from NBDU, we had agreed on 18 out of the 19 grievances raised. We had developed a return to work formula initialized by all parties. And we were ready the following day, Monday, to be able to sign the return to work formula. Unfortunately, that, that did not happen. So my appeal to the union is that Kenyans are suffering. Let us sign the return to work formula and address the one remaining issue. We should not throw the baby in the bathwater. It's an opportunity for us to be able to make a difference. Number two, declaring a cancer a national disaster, it can be a pronouncement, but what happens thereafter? Yes, somebody could come and say it's a national disaster. But will that trigger the resources to be able to flow in tandem to be able to address the pandemic? Will that trigger all actors to be able to act collectively along a common cause? 
those are the kind of questions we need to ask ourselves. We know the burden of cancer is on the rise, and by 2030, from Kenya Health Information Systems, we expect non-communicable diseases led by cancers, hypertension or cardiovascular diseases and diabetes to overtake communicable diseases. And therefore, the problem will even be bigger. But that's a discussion that we can be able to initiate at the ministry level, working together with actors, other actors, so that we can be able to give a good technical advisory. The Cancer being a disaster. Uh, for HIV vaccination initially was based on community approach. But then we realized that if we go to the community approach, what will happen at school level. So we say let's do a multi pro through the community and also through the schools because also there are some girls 10 to 14 who don't go to school for one reason or the other. So they should not be able to lose out of this intervention just because they don't go to school. So community engagement is very, very important and we believe that going forward if you can be able to strengthen the community health promoters then there will be a good channel for communication to the community members. Misdiagnosis, yes, definitely there are cases and most of these usually are handled by the regulatory authority and that is why we are saying it is our role to be able to capacity build the healthcare workers so that they have enough skills and the requisite expertise to be able to make correct judgment. So that even, of course, even in the developed world, we are still misdiagnosis. But you minimize that to the least possible numbers by giving the healthcare workers the right information and the right tools so that they can be able to make the correct decision. And uh, the pista also emphasized on the disrupted services. Again, we are alive to that, and I can assure you the government is committed to addressing this matter once and for all. And the one thing that we have agreed, whether the strike ends today or tomorrow, is that we will not go back to our default settings without putting a system into place to be able to address the perennial issues that keep on appearing in the grievances. 
In fact, we are going to propose a radical departure as to how to address these things. But not only address it from the demand side, but also from the supply side in terms of the quality of the healthcare workers that we are training, that they must meet. Our way to aggregate our requirements for chemotherapeutic agents for the whole country and procurement is done centrally from cancer from cancer for economies of scale so that we can be able to negotiate big discounted uh, prices. But going forward as a country we are also focusing on local manufacturing of health products and technologies. So long as we don't manufacture and we saw during COVID-19 pandemic, you cannot be able to significantly reduce the cost of healthcare if you rely on other jurisdictions to source your health products and technologies. There was one I'll, I'll exception. Now she's on the phone. Okay. She is lost. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I heard my sister Mildred say that uh, from a cancer is very good. But it starts from, I went for a vaccine. And it is painful. Number one, Aga Khan, uh, they sent interns. And I remember I got very cross and I told them to get out of the room and I decided to wait for the doctor who came and did it in the span of four minutes. The other thing is my cousin, we buried her last, last month. She died from cervical cancer and she was admitted at uh, Joe Power Hospital. Yes, yeah, that's where she was. And I remember I stood by her. And the main problem is this test she had to go through before she starts her chemical. And the problem we had was the long wait. We would be there at 7 o'clock, but she would be to, to get to start her chemotherapy maybe at 3 o'clock. She was in so much pain. I noticed that uh, even, the, the, okay, you could see there are many beds, but there are too many people. Is there anything that can be done in terms of adding more beds or something like that about Aga Khan? Uh, as you said, capacity building the people that you're training is very important because from that day, that was about two years ago, I've not gone back to the classroom. Thanks for that. I think I told you about the investment that we have made in the public space from Nakuru to Coast Regional Cancer Center to Garissa. And I told you about other upcoming. I forgot to tell you about it and Kimathi in Nyeri, the one in Kisi that is supported by the Hungarian government. We will still need to invest in the cancer space in terms of equipment, infrastructure, and human capital because the burden is huge. And that is a challenge KUTRH has faced because of the numbers, huh? and because it has modern equipment, many patients tend to go there. And that is why with the support of International Atomic Energy Agency, we want to put a second line arc at uh, Kenyatta, and we'll also be able to have a second line arc at Nakuru. And therefore, by establishing more centers, then we believe that we can be able to improve on the coverage. Uh, that investment cannot be made by the government only, and I'm glad the private sector is also seized of this matter. Now we have a PET scan. We have three PET scans in this country. Now we have a PET scan at Akan, that was the initial one. We have one at KUTRH. Uh, Nairobi West has also put up a PET scan. Uh, we have, uh, I think, uh, now actually we have four because HCG Hospital in Westland also has a PET scan. And Hawaii uh, Family Hospital is building the cancer center. They have already ordered for a PET scan. But even us in the public space, 
I think it's high time now we started investing in PET scans uh, for Nakuru coast and from inception Kisi and Bida and Mark in Nyeri, that should be part of the package. Steps made, small steps that we are going to make uh, despite the tight fiscal space, but showing that commitment. In fact, I can tell you without fear of contradiction that in the next five, seven, eight years, Nairobi is going to be the hub, the medical tourism hub for treatment of all sorts of cancers. Do you know currently we get patients from as far as Cameroon? Yeah. We get people from Guinea. We get people from DR Congo. That is the way to go so that we, we become a region or a center that is so well established that we can be able to accrue dividends from the investments that we have made, both in the public and private sector. That's only possible if we are together. And finally, for all, those of us who have the power to amplify these voices, like you, can we agree today going forward that we are going to make differences in our places of work, in our communities, in the people we interact with? Asantheni. Thank you very much, Bidja. A round of applause for Bidja. Thank you, thank you so, so much. I think we've learned so much. The time is few. We have very little time for this subject. And uh, I think we'll make more, more time to be able to amplify this matter. Uh, a quick photo here with the, with the Guild uh, uh, team and uh, these are key speakers. And then even the, the council warrior can come here. Uh, Martin, may I just quickly encourage Bona DG that it was in 1987 that the leadership of this country mentioned the word sex as we battled the spread of AIDS. Before then, there was stigma. And when that was mentioned, it picked up, and of course now we actually dared it. Uganda was long doing it. So now, Bonadiji, I'm still encouraging you that the leadership must mouth the word pandemic. It will help. Thank you, thank you. You've been thoroughly hurt. <laughs> Men are boy, the boy child is very shy. They don't want to be up here. Welcome, Thank you. Why am I so shy? Give us a scientific explanation. What's that? Brought the one who has done those by behavior of kids. To be able to tell us why we don't want to. Uh, thank you. May take your seats. Welcome to Jamaliza. Please let's settle down. I'm talking about Shikwa and traffic in Nairobi. Linda, let's settle down. You're to Indelea. And I'm happy that uh, Dr. Tari spoke about how invested this uh, test is, perhaps, man. And I think that's why most women shy away. But when I went to Lancet, we were given that HPV test kit. And I was like, yeah, kudos to technology. Because I was told you can do your test, you can take your sample from anywhere. Kwa cho, kwa gari, kwa bafu, kwa wapi. You just take the sample and then you take it to the lab. And I hope these kids will be available in our uh, public hospitals. Because um, it has idea to boost the number of women that go for the test. So allow me now to invite um, Prof. Nelly to speak to us. Being a scientist, please, Prof, speak to us in a language that we can understand. <laughs> I remember when we went for the Africa Climate Summit to Nanza, Buskia, carbon credit, what, what, and we're like, eh, how are we supposed to tell this story if we don't even know what carbon credit is? So please do our men a favor. Most of them are like, we don't know what these things you're talking about are. Please help me invite Prof to the to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I hope I can still maintain your attention on the later part of um, of a Friday afternoon. When, when I was called by the editor's guide by Rosario, and I was told it was cervical cancer, I said I'll drop what I'm doing because the issue of advocacy
The 1940s had the same number of women dying from cervical cancer as we do today. So what changed is that they had national programs. So what our president told us, she's able to go to Lancet and do... But when it's a national program, in countries where there are national programs, we are constantly looking at our data and saying how many of our age eligible women are screened? Where are the gaps? Who are the women not getting tested? What category? How do we reach them? That's the missing thing. So in Kenya, we have a national program, but it's not resourced. So if you go to the Division of Family Health, we'll tell you we do something called visual inspection with acetic acid. And this is uh, Professor Motho, so Dr. Mo talked about, we have the tools. And I'll, I'll just quickly try and go through the tools. I'm trying to like build through this. But we have the tools for prevention. One, we now have a highly effective and safe vaccine. And I know there's a lot of misinformation on the vaccine. I think as, as journalists, you've heard the stories, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to underline them because I was told in a little bit of my communication, if you repeat it, other people repeat it, and people will not know if it was true <laughs> because it sounds saucy. So a lot of misinformation. But we have millions and millions of people vaccinated. In my house, every boy, every girl has been vaccinated. In my clinical trial site, everybody's vaccinated, and their families are vaccinated because we're strong believers, and because we know this vaccine is, is safe. We've been doing research on this vaccine from 2014. So I can tell you without a doubt that the information on safety is robust. It's a vaccine-like particle. It's not a live vaccine. So what people get is pain on the jab, a lot of, you know, a bit more pain than usual, a bit of fever for some of them, and then it's gone. They don't get the disease because it's a virus-like particle, it's a synthetic vaccine. Highly effective, 98% effective. More effective than measles and polio and all other vaccines, right? And now we have data from research done here in Kenya by Kenya scientists that one dose is enough. The national program, the national immunization program people are still evaluating the data to shift to one dose. But we have lots of countries, Nigeria, Bangladesh, um, Ireland, the UK, Australia, have also moved to the one dose schedule. And the World Health Organization recommended the one dose schedule. I'm actually very proud of that data because we did that work here as Cambridge scientists to prove that one dose is as good as the multiple dose schedules. So it's a vaccine that's safe and works really, really well. There's a little clip I like to show when I have a slide, and it says, we have a vaccine for cancer. Why are you not using it? Mm. And I think that's a question we need to ask ourselves, ask our families when you go home, my dear fellow man, please ask yourselves, why isn't your daughter protected? Why isn't she vaccinated? The vaccine can also be given to boys. It's safe, because men, also get oropharyngeal cancer, head and neck cancers, 45% from HPV infection. Most anal cancers are in men more than women, also from human papilloma virus. Now, penile cancer, 70% from human papilloma virus. But penile cancer is not common, so you don't hear about it. So what's this problem with cervical cancer? And we talked about stigma. Now, how many people can comfortably talk about the vagina? 
in their homes. Can that be discussed? No. It's a taboo. It's a taboo. How do you tell your mother to get screened and where and on what? <laughs> it becomes a bit of a challenge, eh? yeah. or your older sister. So those are some of the challenges in awareness and in messaging. You know, what we call, when we do research, we often have what we call community advisory groups, yeah? So when we're doing the research, before we start, we go to the community and representation. We tell them the work we want to do. They give us feedback, what they think about it. We tell them how we'll do it, and we meet regularly. And I remember one of our community advisory group members, she's a nurse. And she was at pain when she explained to us her mother's story with cervical cancer. And she said she went home, and she realized that her mother had moved out of her father's bedroom. And she thought it was a little peculiar, but they didn't discuss it. But the next time she came, it sort of nagged her. So she went to her mother's bedroom, and she opened the bed sheet. It was a flood of blood with blood clots because that's what cervical cancer does. And one of the reasons most people don't talk about it is because the early signs is very you know, foul smelling distant. Because cancer becomes a wound, and it's a wound which begins to rot. Because the cells are growing really, really fast, and the blood supply is not enough, and they shed off, and it smells. Now how does a 60, 45 year old woman, who pays their bills when they're sick, who do they call on? Their children, those children, are they often daughters or boys? Who has the money? Boys. How do you tell your son you have a discharge? You smell. So our people come late, yeah? When it's no longer deniable. By the time they are bleeding that heavily to soak their beds, it's really, really late. When I was in training in Kenyatta, we used to have a ward called what, six then one day, a gyne, gyne acute room. And we have two, two rooms full of women with cervical cancer. It was a really smelly room. But there was so much pain and suffering in that space. And we reached a point in the hospital where we wouldn't admit these women. Bagathi elsewhere to get transfusion before they come for radiotherapy. I know you feel that pain. And when you're a provider that is telling a family, coming with somebody that sick, that you're not going to admit them, and they're crying in pain, you're in pain too. But that's what happens, and that's why we need to prevent this cancer with a sense of urgency. So my plea to journalists, this vaccine needs to be taken up. Our uptake has been low. Initially, there was a global shortage. And you know, similar to COVID, guess who got vaccinated first? Who's making the vaccine? The men. No, it's a West. Oh, the West. Yeah, that's why Scotland this year, what Dr. Amok talked about, was able to show that all the girls that vaccinated in 2017 Millions of them, none of them. Australia is towards elimination, which is less than four per 100,000. Australia was an early adapter. So countries are moving to very low number of cases. Now I ask myself, what will happen when the Western countries no longer see this disease? <coughs> Who, who manufactures this new test, the drugs, the equipment? Are we doing it? No. Where's the innovation from? The West. I know you've heard of neglected tropical diseases, right? Yes. So my fear is that this may very soon join the category of what? Neglected. Because now in countries where they're seeing very few cases, they're saying they want to change how they screen. Because you're not likely to pick up disease. They're getting rid of it. So how you screen is different when it's a rare disease. But it's not a rare disease for us. So if we don't pave our way forward and don't catch up, we will lose mothers. There's some other aspect which is not well discussed. And I always ask this question. What is the cost of the death of a 45-year-old woman? She's not going to get the funeral of a high-ranking general, bless his soul, for his work. 
She's buried quietly. True or false? True. Who's left crying? Children. What happens to those children? Teenage pregnancy, mm. am I right? Mm. School dropout, mm. what happens to the man? Can he work properly? No. So there's society disruption. Mm. So I always say when the government or we as a society don't invest in protecting women, we are harming ourselves without the foresight of the value of keeping that age group of women who die from cervical cancer alive. Mm -hmm. I remember once when we were talking HIV with Treasury, one of the Treasury officers said, you know these oh yeah stories? Oh yeah, women are dying. Oh yeah, this disease is coming. There's oh yeah everywhere to them. Oh yeah, people are dying on the road. We need to go back to them and tell them, when we save this life, what do we get back? What's the gain to the economy? What do we save going forward? So that vaccine, I hope I've convinced you, it's a highly safe, and effective vaccine. We have population level data to show it. I have done this research for several years. I'm following a cohort of young people who vaccinated nine years ago. None of them are getting infections. So for me, it's hands on, it's real. Both safety and effectiveness. And I've told you one dose is enough. For girls between ages nine and 20, they can get one dose. That's a trial I personally am doing. And we're now going to our year five of follow-up in that cohort. Mm -hmm. And our data repeatedly shows us the same high level of protection. For the older, we don't know. And for boys, we don't have that data. Why are we concentrating on vaccinating women? Because the highest burden is cervical cancer. So there's something else called herd protection. Herd protection means if we vaccinate girls, then boys also get protected. So overpopulations where they have high coverage, over 50% coverage, then the effects start showing up in the boys too. So our priority where resources are limited is to vaccinate girls. When there are adequate resources, then we do what we call gender neutral vaccination and we want to vaccinate boys. So when I had access, my boys got vaccinated. Okay, screening. We talked about how painful and uncomfortable pap smears is. Mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> but it needs to be done because the cancer hurts so much more. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Please turn up. Please get screened. But I want to tell you the screening schedule need not be annual. Mm -hmm. This is a cancer that takes a long time. From the time of HPV infection, there are lots and lots of HPV types, over 100. Then we have about 14 high risk which cause cancer. Then about five that cause seven, that cause 90% of the cervical cancers. It takes up to 10 years from that time to invasive cancer. So we have this wide window of opportunity to screen a woman and protect her. The pre-cancer lesions detected, we treat them in health centers. What Dr. Moth talked about thermal ablation, I, don't, I didn't screen up. But the equipment for thermal ablation is something really small with a flat thing at the top. And then we train the nurses to use them. And it does 20 seconds on the lesion, and you're off the bed, you're treated. If we can pick it in, pre-cancer. The visual inspection tool, you use vinegar. Do not do a vinegar, but it has to be well, the right concentration, 5%. When you apply vinegar on the cervix and the early changes, we can see them. So you can see that and you can zap zap and she's good to go. But we don't have a program. And this visual inspection is difficult for training and the nurses and the time hasn't really been there. Mm. And you say pap smears are difficult, a pap smear needs a lab, you take the sample, it goes to the lab, you come back for results. So loss to follow up, cost, return visits, all of them. So now comes the HPV test, and that's a self-sampling that you experience. So the self-sampling is that you can take the swab, it's a dry swab, and the woman self-inserts herself. And she does this, puts it back, drops it off to the lab. Much nicer, right? Mm -hmm. And it's as good as physician collected. The data is robust. Mm -hmm. And HPV testing is more sensitive than pap smear. It performs better. 
Is this that we we'll need to do something else amongst a select few who have HPV and then treat them? So we agree we have tools, right? And then if you have early cancer, if we do a hysterectomy, you're cured. That's a done deal. We can do hysterectomies in Mandela Syndrome. Everywhere we can do hysterectomies. So we have all the tools we need to protect I hope I tried not to to talk colloquial. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, see I hope how it's making yeah. sense. Yeah. And I, I'm trying to see what other points I might have talked about. I said you can vaccinate boys. Boys get endo cancer, what, and all other types of things. I think I've come across like two cases of penile cancer. It's horrible. You don't want it. And of course, there are what, sir. I tell people what are just not nice. Has anybody seen genital warts? They look like cauliflower. Makes peeing very hard for the men, but they are treatable. But the vaccine also prevents warts, highly effective. And then we have oropharyngeal cancers, which are also preventable. So I think I've tried to go through all of this, except I was very ill-mannered. I didn't thank you at the beginning, and I appreciate all of you. <laughs> and the president, Zubeda, right? And um, our president, um, Omungo? CEO. CEO, sorry, apologies. Yeah. Yes. And my friend, I want to get the right name that you prefer to be used, Mildred. You told us it's not activist. I know you're a survivor <laughs> warrior, but there's another name. Inspirational speaker. Inspirational speaker. Yeah. And you inspired, I think, when you talked to us. So I, 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 can't, I can't say it enough. I used to harass women in my mother's sitting room, asking them if they were screened constantly. Three years ago, a very close relative of mine had been calling me with backache, and I wasn't paying attention, I was busy. And when she turned up, she had stage two cervical cancer. That treatment cost 250,000. NIH used to cover it, NHF, right? Currently, I have somebody in my house with breast cancer. A round of chemo is 150,000. She will need three cycles every th three weeks. Where does that money come from? So everything we can do for prevention. And it breaks my heart that also for breast cancer, the awareness that if you have a lump, get worried, is still not there. That people don't know where their cervix is. And that we're not screening, that we don't have coverage, and that we're not vaccinated. So please start with your homes. Can I ask you, all of you? Mm -hmm. Please harass people in your homes. Follow them up, hound them, make sure your wives are screened. You will not forgive yourselves. Mm -hmm. Talk to your sisters and get your girls vaccinated in your households. So thank you very much. Do we have questions? Najua wengi tunauliza how is cervical cancer, throat cancer related, anal cancer. You know, times have changed. What do you want to do with You know? Kuliko kando na zili ambazo tumezizoea. Yeah? And our kids have become very sexually active. You see a nine-year-old, eight-year-old, already wana jua. Mahombia mamu wu na miyambia nini about sex. I already know these things, you know? So and that's why I told myself, bro, I don't want a day to come, God forbid, they say, me, I wish I did it that time. Because we have the information, but what are we doing with this information? Are we helping our kids? Then say, I wish I knew. So we have questions. Amato, can you help us? Prof, maybe you can come here and then respond to some of these questions. Uh -huh. start here. Yes, uh, my question is, this, uh, this disease is uh, given to women by men. How come it does not affect men? Mm -hmm. That's my question. And second, you talked you talked of 98% uh, effectiveness. Is this is that what WHO is also saying? Or uh, somehow exaggerated? <laughs> then another one. All these forms of cancer. Which one is the deadliest, the most lethal, and uh, the most prevalent in Kenya? 
Thank you. Just take note I'm about to move. This, it seems this is the time for the boy child. You want to put it to swam away with the light. You know, Kenyans don't like to laugh. I think I'll pay you some money, like Churchill and then you check. Yeah, my, my, I, I don't know this a question or observation. We are, there's this information overload. Like since we've been here, you've given us a lot of information. We've learned so much. Hopefully when we go out, we'll be able to implement one or two things. But then what, my concern is this. In this information overload, of course, there's a lot of fake news, this and that and that. Nutrition, I didn't hear that aspect of nutrition. Let me help you with that part. Because there's too much information. Don't eat this, don't eat that. Do this, do that, do that, you know? So other than the vaccine and all those other things you say, where does uh, uh, nutrition come in? And especially, you know, some of us love out there. And some people will tell you, please, three quarters of the plate. A third of the plate should be ugali only, or uh, protein, meat, yeah, yeah, nutrition. Let's just know how nutrition can also help us. Thank you, lost on exercise, of course. Thank you, Dr. Nelly. Um, my first question has to do with um, what I learned in India they call medical touch. 